Hi, this is Agent Ward. Oh, my hand's over here. Um, thanks for coming to my How to Sell a Bazillion Books workshop. I am so glad that you're here today. We are going to go over a lot of practical stuff about selling. And uh, selling also goes for free books, paid books, any price. It's totally practical information. You're going to be so glad you took this workshop. Um, and so I'm going to go off the screen right now. I thought you guys might want to say hi. Hello. Um, <laughs> just to see who you're talking to. Um, and so we'll go right into the slideshow. Okay? Ready? Let's go. Okay, again, welcome to the How to Sell a Bazillion Books Workshop, also titled Capturing the Golden Goose. That's true, dude. There's going to be a duck in this. I'm just kidding. It's a goose. Uh, <laughs> anyway, ready? Here we go. I know. You're very excited. I'm excited, too. Let's, let's talk about this. Um, this is what we're going over today. This is... This this slide, and yes, they're written a little weird, so make sure you pay attention. Don't fall asleep. You do not need coffee for this webinar. I'm going to make it interesting for you, and no, I won't talk like this the whole time because it'll drive you nuts, but um, I'm going to talk about uh, lots of stuff, So, and it's really practical, easy to use stuff, easy to apply no matter what stage you're at, so whether or not, uh, whether you're rebranding or just starting out or you're like, all your books are 99 cents, if they're free, if they're $3.99, if they're $5.99, if they're $20 million, that might not work. But <laughs> um, this is applicable to all of those things. And here's our main question, is what makes a reader decide to invest their time in one author versus another? Um, so this workshop is actually a practical view of why a reader buys a book. We wanted very practical stuff that you can take right now, today, wherever you are, and apply it to your book. The thing you need first is your book. Once you got that, here you go. And this is the part that intimidates a lot of people, and it really doesn't have to. Um, I've broken it down into a very easy to follow uh, methodology that you can apply to any book in any genre. And so I know you're looking at the stuff at the top and it looks like it's all um, romance and stuff, but I write I write several different genres also and it works across the board, which is absolutely awesome. So if you're like, I write macabre, you know, horror stories for old people, you can use this too. Um, you may not have a huge fan base. You may not have a lot of people. That's okay. My Stone Prison book has like three readers. That's all right. Um, we'll get back to that in a little bit. Okay. Practical workshop. We want to know why a reader buys a book. About me. If you don't know who I am, um, I'm just going to give some credentials so you, you're wondering why you should listen to me or why I think stuff works. or um, It's good to know, right? So I've sold about... 10 million books since 2011 when I first published. I'm 100% indie. I have no traditional uh, deals with any of the publisher houses, um, no US anything. Audio books that I've done, I've done on my own. I've done paper on my own. Um, I do a lot of, obviously, digital. Um, I'm on uh, Amazon, Barnes & Nobles, Kobo, iTunes. I have my books on ACX. Um, and I have a huge fan base, um, like over 100,000 Facebook fans, and my email list has about 50,000 subscribers right now. So um, that's been since 2011. Honestly, I neglected some of that stuff in the beginning because I didn't know what I was doing. And I've come up with these steps as I was going, and I'd, like I would have died if somebody told me this when I started. Like I'm, I'm a person that wants to know why. I want to know what to do and why things work. And if you're in this on your own, you really need to think that way. Why did this work as opposed to this? And we're going to get into that stuff today, which is absolutely awesome um, because it's very practical. You, it's not a chance or a magical thing, you know, um, and a lot of people think whether or not a book performs well or even has a shot is magic, and that, that's, that's not true. One of the things that you'll, you'll find out about me if you don't already know me is I'm not afraid to call it like it is. And I'm not bashing anything or anyone um, because everybody, they need to do what's best for them, whether you do traditionally published things or not. But there are things to know that are on both sides of the fence. And it, it's a whole lot, the mouthpiece for the traditionally published uh, side is a lot louder than the indie side. And it has been for a while. And with the market changes and what's going on, I'm going to make sure you know both sides during this too. So I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, 
tell you like it is. Um, I, 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 don't, I don't believe in um, bullshitting and, uh, you know, saying, saying what people want to hear. I need to tell you what you need to know to be successful. Um, and, and these are things that I've done. And so they're practical things and they currently work. Um, and they've worked for several years. So these, this is the cream of the crop. And we're going to get into that in a minute. I'm not going to talking about myself. Can you tell I totally went off on a tangent? Anyway, I'm going to share a secret with you. With all the talk that I do about indies, 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 and indie rah, rah, rah. Um, yeah, um, I almost went traditional. My first book uh, is called Demon Kissed. It's my debut. It was young adult paranormal romance. Um, and I wrote it in 2010, found an agent uh, very quickly, and uh, it went on submission to New York and I had people that were excited about it and I very quickly figured out that that was not for me um, and so we parted ways and um, to date I think I did pretty good right I mean <laughs> I um, I've hit the New York Times list uh, over a dozen times now and, and USA Today and Wall Street Journal um, I was number one in digital book world which was really cool because um, I was one of the first indie authors to do that. Um, I'm not a hybrid author so I don't have uh, a deals with um, traditional deals with other you know to sell off print or whatever on my books. I've, I've kept all the rights. Um, I've been featured in articles in the New York Times and Forbes and the Huffington, Huffington Post the, and that's just to name a few. Um, I've, I've been all over the place. I have absolutely wonderful uh, reporters that I've met along the way. When I shot my mouth off, you helped me um, cultivate what I was saying a little bit and gave me a sounding board. And honestly, the, the market is phenomenal and, and it's a really nice place to be right now. Um, indie authors in the past had a huge stigma and while some of that still remains, it's also becoming much more evident that indie writers are change agents. They're people that aren't happy with the system the way that it was. They want to take things into their own hands and they want to um, have new stuff. I mean like the new adult books, that, that whole genre came out of indies. New York wasn't publishing that. And so um, we're, we're innovators people. Um, you're on the cool side of the fence. I don't know if you know that or not, but dude, you're with the cool kids. So <laughs> write that down in case, in case you forgot it. Um, anyway, I don't speak at industry events very much and when um, this event uh, came up, I, I just had to because I love my indie peeps. You got to know that this is hard. It's very hard in the beginning and anybody that says it's not is, I don't know what they're thinking. It's hard. I work my ass off and so do all my friends and, um, and we all have varying levels of success but something that's consistent through every single one of them, nobody thought they'd be here and it's because we all had it shoved into our brains from the day one that you can't sell that many books. You know, I thought I'd be lucky when I started with just Demon Kissed. I thought I'd be lucky if I sold 5,000. I thought maybe I could do that. You know, I couldn't even imagine what 5,000 looks like. And then I went maybe 8,000. And so I'm really good at selling. I have a, a pretty good track record with selling, uh, you know, doing sales with um, just tangible goods, intangible goods, soft lines, and, uh, you know, clothes or soft lines. And so, um, uh, yeah, that's why I was just like, I, I think I can. So I, I had had an idea. Dude, I had no freaking idea. I Millions of copies. Um, that's insane. I didn't think I'd sell millions of copies. And basically, if you if you figure out some of the, these things, um, you can exceed your expectations. And will everyone sell millions of copies? No, but you don't need to sell millions of copies for this to be a, an awarding and amazing livelihood. Um, before I hit any lists, I was making more money than I had ever made in my entire life. And it was doing something I loved, which is absolutely amazing. And when you're an indie, you can decide what you want to do, when you want to do it, how much work you want to put into it, um, if you want to write now or if you want to, you know, go take your kids to the park. I mean, like, you have a lot of latitude. And um, it's just, it's freeing and it's a really great job. And so I know some people are like, well, money, money. Okay, literature, writing is an art. No, no, no qualms about that. Definitely is. Um, for me, writing is bearing the soul. Like, it just... That's the way it is. And you may be looking at my books going, what? And we'll get into that in a little bit. But it just, 
it's not um, it's not mass produced crap. That's not what I'm into. It's writing books that relate to people on an emotional level, and so. Um, it's just a really exciting time to do what you love and to be able to make a living off of it. And when you know the things that I'm going to go over that are in this workshop about what makes somebody want this book over, you know, that book, you start to see the pieces of the puzzle and then you can start to see the big picture and how everything fits together. Dude, it is a puzzle. Um, it's not, you know, like a haze of fog where you can't tell which end is up. Um, it's something that you can uh, riddle and kind of figure out. Um, and, and I made it this part easy because I'm giving you all the pieces. And so, <laughs> and they're very easily plug inable to your stuff, which is absolutely amazing. See, I don't like talking about myself. I just straight again. Anyway, um, going back to me for two more seconds. My formal education is in theology. I went to seminary. My books tend to follow a, kind of a hermeneutical sermonish shape. Um, they're definitely influenced by academia. Um, you'll notice sometimes I flip into academic mode where all of a sudden my vernacular totally changes and you're like, is that the same person? Yes, it is. Um, when I'm speaking and talking and everything, it's uh, you, you, you convey and speak to the people that uh, there's a certain demographic. Like when you're talking to teenagers you can't sound like an adult and you have to like teenagers dude and so um, I love kids so writing young adult was just like a no-brainer for me and that's where I started um, and so I actually wrote new adult I have some science fiction I'm working on weird right um, but I like it and I thought I'd try it and um, the romance books the new adult stuff was something I stumbled into before I even realized that was a genre going these um, <laughs> anyway let's see Oh, the, the whole thing about, the last thing about me, in case you're like, she just writes, you know, erotic romance books. A lot of people think I write erotic romance books, and uh, I don't. Um, I, I definitely don't think I do. There's an erotic element to them, but that's not what they're about. Um, my books, all of them, including the young adult ones, the uh, um, Poe-like fairy tales that are a little weird, um, <laughs> And my romance books, my new adult books, my young adult books, all of them have a common element where they're all focused on the human condition. Um, aspects like hope, poverty, redemption. There's a redemption thread in every single book I've ever written. And sexuality is a component in there, too, because it's part of the human condition. It's part of what makes us human, our ability to love. Um, and so... People tend to overlook those, especially those elements, and because they kind of take them for granted, where they're like, oh, you connected with me. And that's why. It's because they're things that we all struggle with, and they're all things that we hope for, and things that we want, and perseverance. And it, it, yeah, anyway, it's, it's, it's a fun time to be a, be a writer. Um, my, books, my books are about life, and I love that I actually get to write about things that are close to my heart. That said, I know some people are really bleh with the whole commercial aspect that's involved in this. If you're talking about selling books, you're talking about making money um, to some extent or being able to commercialize it so that even if you're giving stuff away, um, you're, you're thinking about an element of how to do that. And so we're calling the commercial element, if you're not aware of what that means, just, uh, just the, the exchange of books or selling of books. Um, and it's good to realize that a commercial element elements involved. Um, most people, they're writing a book because they want people to read it. They're not just writing it to shove it under their mattress and make pillows out of paper or old computer parts. <laughs> um, you know, and then we have this thing where nobody wants to sell out and, re, you know, come across as the yucky, greasy, used car salesman guy. Um, that's not selling. That's like being creepy okay um, selling is helping a reader find a book that they want to read okay that's important you need to think of selling as helping think about how hard it is to find the perfect book one that has everything that you could possibly want in it where you're like oh my god this is the best book ever I love this book and like you just keep talking about it and you talk about it to everybody until they're like oh my god shut up um, <laughs> you know it is so hard to find that kind of book. And um, this is what you're doing. 
selling is helping people, connecting people with the right book. Um, and if it's your book, woohoo! And if it's somebody else's book, you know, you do that too. Um, and so, selling is helping. It's important to remember that. And let's see. Dun 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 dun. It's time to change the slide. Ready? Wake up. <laughs> A lot of people think the main obstacle in selling is price. I'm going to tell you that it's not price. It is not price. It is not price. It has nothing to do with price anymore. And you're like, that's not true. Dude, it's totally true. There are books for free. You can fill up your whole Kindle and never read everything that's on there. And yeah, I say Kindle all the time because I have too many Kindles. Um, but yeah, people that you readers are full. And so um, when they have that much free stuff to read, 99 cent stuff, what's causing them to get your book, not get your book, to read your book, to not read your book, it has nothing to do with price anymore. And I mean, that's a major concept to grab. Over the past three years, this is something that's changed. It no longer has anything to do with price. So if price isn't the main obstacle, what is it? Ready? I'm going to tell you what it is. It's time. Okay? You have to get that. People are okay with spending, you know, whatever amount of money on something. They are not okay with wasting their time on a book that is not what they wanted or that doesn't end you know, summarize or doesn't, it doesn't end in a way that, that makes them feel good that they read it. Um, they've been burned. They're leery now. And so, um, and, and that has to do with the amount of books on the market. There are a lot of books on the market. Okay, so guys, we got to get this in our head, whether you're selling books for free, 99 cents, 2.99, whatever. What we're trying to do is not pry their money from their hands. We're trying to get them to give us a little bit of their time to see if we have a good match for them, if our book is what they're looking for. And there are a bunch of cues that do that before you even get started, and that's what we're going to talk about, is attracting the right reader to your book. Ready? Here we go. Oh, we did this before. I wrote it down because it's important. Are you ready? Selling is about helping a reader find the perfect book. So did you get that? The stuff in white's important if you like just want to scan. And I told you I wrote it weird, so you pay attention, don't fall asleep. Dun, 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 dun. Okay, now we're getting started. See? Look at that. We're getting started. Okay. Um, <laughs> there's a reason why indie publishing is appealing. Dude, if you're in this class, there's a reason. You know there's a reason. Um, it's appealing to you on some level. Um, okay, I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you. Here's the reason. Full control. That's it. That's my reason. I'm a control freak. I want full control of everything. When I was talking to New York and saw that, uh, yeah, I wasn't going to have control, and I didn't have the, the strongest feelings that they firmly knew what they were doing with some things, it, it, was, it wasn't reassuring. I like that I have full control in this, in this uh, because, yeah, it's just... The market's changed. Stuff's going on. You know, um, advances now, if you go traditionally, they're not as high as they had been. And so say you even get a six-figure advance, which is unheard of right now. Most of them are much lower. Um, I think the average advance at this time is 5000 to $8,000 total payout uh, for a series that earns out, which is weird too. Um, and then sell some extra is $12,000, which you're in the marginal amount of people at this time. Um, you know, that's not enough to live on. That's not enough at all. And so advances have gotten lower. Um, the market's unstable. If people, if a publishing house buys your rights right now, will they be here in a year? Will they be here in two years? The production time for a book to get to market is, generally speaking, is 18 months. Um, most of us aren't going to get a deal where you cut the line and your book's out in six months. That's not really heard of. And with, uh, you know, Borders Foul, guys, that, that was a huge store. It shouldn't have that shouldn't have happened in all honesty. Um, you know, and lots of people have been speculating who's next. And the effects on borders rippled through the entire um, publishing ecosystem and shook out a lot of loose edges and things that uh, weren't earning their keep, if you want to put it that way. And it screwed over a lot of people that were earning their keep. Hello, authors. <laughs> a bunch of people didn't get paid. Um, when I was shopping my stuff in New York, that's when borders fell. That was one of the reasons why I ran away. Um, people had their manuscripts 
tied up at agencies with publishers where they signed them over, but they weren't published yet. And so they got stuck in a spot where they had to go through all this stuff with courts to get their oh, – bleh, it was a mess. Like I just went, I don't want to be in an industry that's falling apart from the inside. That's not fun. Um, anyway, and then i got to say this part. This part's funny because, okay, you know, I, I have brand neck name recognition now with branding. People see HM Ward, they know what that means. That means you're going to get an evocative book that has some, um, either some sexy stuff in it. That's funny, right? Um, anyway, I, I, I call it love, but you know, uh, I, yeah, so we'll just skip over that. But um, my name, if, and you think of other, other authors, big name authors out there that you can just think of off the top of your head. And I'm not going to say their names right now, but you can think of them. Who writes romance? Think of a name. Um, who writes mysteries? Think of a name. Who writes thrillers? Think of a name. Okay. The three names you just thought of, because I know everybody just thought of a name. Did anybody go, HarperCollins, Penguin, Random Penguin? Uh, no, right? Because, dude, it's the author. The author becomes the brand. The publishing house didn't brand their stuff. And so nobody cares if they're reading a Penguin book or what it means or, um, you know, a HarperCollins book or what that means. It doesn't mean anything, and it's because they didn't brand them. Um, they use our names as branding. And, you know, I've we've done that, and, and they can do that. But most authors don't actually get to brand their own names because it's – it's tricky and it takes a lot of consistency and effort and time and you know when you're an indie author you can do that um, traditional publishers uh, you know one of the main carrots that they have left is paper which papers cool but at the same time when you have he heavy hitters saying that uh, you know their paper sales weren't you know they were surprised they didn't see their book in stores and you know this was in an article recently by Jamie McGuire why she went back to indie publishing dude that's weird she had a bunch of huge books why wasn't her her book her paper wasn't around and so you have stuff all over the place and it's not just her print runs are shrinking and why it's because um, digital they figured out there's a lot of money in digital and that's the way the market's swinging so for being an indie that's good you get full control over everything, all your rights, everything, every aspect of it. And some people, that freaks you out, but it doesn't have to. Instead of letting someone else run away with your train, you can run away on it too. And whatever happens along the way, it's you did it. You have full control over everything. And some people may be going, oh, that sounds horrible. I'm going to show you why it's not, so hold on a second. Um, full control. Next slide. Indie Perk. You get direct access to readers. You get the ability to control the brand. Hello, that's huge. Um, ability to refine things. Dude, that's huge too. Um, you can change things, like flat out change them. You know, like your cover's ugly. You decided your blurb sucks. Wipe them out. Go on. Redo. Um, and royalties, instead of for a few years, they're lifelong royalties. You don't have to wait for something to earn out. And honestly, it doesn't cost a fortune to to make an indie book it doesn't cost ten thousand dollars to put out one book and do it yourself um, and there's a whole bunch of information on that on the internet so I'm not going to get into that um, I have information on that on my blog too if you're like what how do I do that today I'm focusing strictly on these three facets of selling so that that way um, we walk away with the information you need and you're not here for ten hours Okay, these things, these indie parks, they are so huge because direct access is is major. And brand control and refining, changing, and the royalties, hello, like that's lifetime. Hello, that's long. Okay, next slide. <sighs> this is what I've been saying. As an indie, you sink or swim based on your actions. You control your future. So for people that they've been on the traditional side of the fence and been slamming their heads into it for God knows how long because their publisher doesn't get the whole new adult book cover thing or doesn't get that this cover doesn't work, a garage door doesn't seem like a mystery book. You know, like it doesn't, I've read so many things about that and talked to so many authors and because I'm always like, oh, they can't be that silly all the time. Dudes, they're silly. They're silly a lot of the times. <laughs> and whenever you, if you go traditional, you're handing all those things over. And they're some of your most important things. Um, they are the most important things. <clears throat> 
in the past, people have thought that going indie meant you had to sacrifice things. Dude, that's not true. Um, quality, marketing, branding, advertising, those are all things that you assumed that New York would do better. Um, and you know what happens when you assume people? Write it down if you don't know. Um, <laughs> It's the first three words is the main thing. Um, nobody wants to be that. And so, and, and it's just not true. You don't have to sacrifice quality or marketing or branding or advertising or anything else. There's this idea that traditional, publish have, traditional publishers have all this information in like a golden box and they'll put it on our heads like a beautiful crown, you know, if we sign over everything, you know, digital rights too. Um, even after saying that they thought digital books were not going anywhere. You know, the truth is, the truth is that there, I, I don't like that New York's talking out of both sides of their mouth, but they're kind of stuck in that spot now because they back themselves into a corner. But with this stuff, with quality, marketing, branding, advertising, we have the same level of access, the access to the same level of service providers that they use. And in some cases, they're the same people. Dude, that's mind-blowing. I can hire an editor from Random Penguin? Uh-huh. I can. It's like, wow, no way. Okay. And I have this list of stuff to just prove a point. You ready? They use stock art. I use stock art. They use editors. I use editors. I do. I use editors. They use proofreaders. Dude, me too. I use proofreaders. They use graphic designers. Oh, my God. So do I. I use graphic designers. They make a marketing plan, sort of. I'm not going to go there. We already know how I, how I feel about marketing plans. If you don't, look up my Roses Are Dead thing on publishing on my blog. I make a huge-ass marketing plan. Um, they can schedule appearances for you at book conventions. No freaking way. And they'll make you go. You can schedule appearance. Oh, oh, my God. And at the same ones? Yes, yes, you can. Oh, and I have to pay for that? Yes, you do. Whether you're, you're traditional or not, somebody's paying for it. It's coming out of something. Um, are you seeing a pattern? I mean, like, they use stock art. We use stock art. And there's this whole big thing about stock art right now, whether you should use stock art or don't use stock art. Everybody uses stock art. I'm, I'm, I'm a professional photographer and was for a very long time until I retired. I've won awards. I love shooting um, a camera. <laughs> and the thing is... It doesn't make any sense for a book cover. Um, it just, and I'll get into that when we start talking about things in a little while. But don't be shy about, about stock art. There is tons and tons and tons of it, and more of it comes in every day and is super affordable. That is part of the reason why, even though I can shoot, process, and get exactly what picture I want because I have this picture in my head and I need this picture, I don't need that picture. Using a sister shot or something similar is good enough. And because it serves its purpose, cover has a function. Um, and we're going to get into that later. I'm getting ahead of myself. Anyway, my point is that with all this stuff, you have access to the same high-quality service providers as New York. Just because you're indie doesn't mean you have to sacrifice anything. That's just not true. Um, the middleman was impaled and left holding a paperback saying the digital age will never count for anything. Um, <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah, I know. Um, <laughs> the traditional publishers, this is the problem. They failed to adapt. They didn't stay ahead of the curve. And this last part's nuts. They tried to change the tide. You can't change the tide. The tide's going that way for a reason. Um, so the indie author has a different thing. You can adapt, and it's expected. You can stay ahead of the curve, and damn straight you're going to stay ahead of the curve because, you know, it's important. You need to feed your kids. You'll figure out how to stay ahead of the curve when the market changes. You're not going to be the last guy to the table to change your stuff because you're watching everything and reading everything. Um, the person that is the most invested in your book is you. It doesn't matter who you are. If you're indie, traditionally published, a huge name, a no name, it's still you. The person who's the most invested in HM Ward books is me, is HM Ward. <laughs> it's not anybody else. It's me. Um, and do I want to stay ahead of the curve? Hell yeah. I hit the next slide. Oh, 
this is the woo cool area. Okay. Anyway, I have some more stuff to say. You got to hold on a second before we go into the golden trifecta stuff. Until recently, we handed over all this stuff. Okay, we handed over the the stuff, the quality. We just assumed we didn't have any, um, and we handed over these things, the perks that I was talking about before. Oh my God, those are huge. We forked over a bunch of money. We forked over the ability to change things, to refine things, to your branding, to people that don't really brand anything. Um, you guys know Blake Patterson, who's crazy about branding, has his own brand management people. Um, his publisher didn't have much to do with that. Um, and other people that have branded themselves, they did it. Um, it's not something that typically comes from the publishing house. There is a methodology to branding, and um, when asking people what it is at traditional publishing houses, they don't really know how to answer. And yes, I have asked them, <laughs> and um, and I get blank looks a lot when I'm talking to them about these things, about marketing, about branding, about um, even a, like a release date plan. It's like, guys, come on, you gotta get a, you gotta get on the ball here, because um, yeah, I, I've been trying to work with them because I keep assuming the grass is greener on the other side, and I think a lot of people do that because they've told us the grass is greener over there, and the thing is, it's not, and it's it just. <sighs> I keep looking over the fence and it's like, and I know you guys do too, everybody does that. And so I don't need their affirmation. My fans my fans give me affirmation. And once your books connect with enough people that you're like, oh my God, it's still, yeah, it's still, you still wonder at times. And so even though as I'm telling you all this stuff, it's bizarre to go, Holly, why are you still talking to New York? Because I wanted to see if things changed. I want to see them jump ahead of the ball, um, ahead of the ball, ahead of the curve. Ahead of the ball would be awesome. Um, <laughs> and right now they're not they're still dragging their feet you know stuck in the mud and it's just it's sad you know um i don't want the the paper book industry to dry up either i kind of hope somebody will revive it um it's a part of uh of of history it's just amazing i mean going all the way back i'm gonna, i'm going off on a tangent but i mean like if you think of from gutenberg to now holy crap like that's just huge part of human history and then you take stuff from the digital age now it's we're like in another renaissance in terms of everything that's going on with literature and the massive influx of information and things that you can get your hands on and the world shrinking and becoming smaller it's just amazing anyway um, before I stray too far away from things um, indies have an interest in honing in on these things to get the maximum performance from the work because you are the person that cares the most about your work. Publishers really don't have motivation to refine the process. I mean, like, why would they? If if a book doesn't hit the goal out of the gates, they kind of abandon it. And from a business perspective, that makes sense because it's like, oh, well, that didn't work. And um, so why should you spend more time on it? And that's the thing. If it's your book, um, you're going to want to spend more time on it. And so um, even if it doesn't launch correctly, you can go back and fix it. That's that's a huge thing. And so ab abandoning a book isn't a, isn't a thing when you're an indie. Um, it's not the indie way. And when you focus on the three elements that I'm getting ready to give you with my golden trifecta thingy here, um, it'll really, really help. And you can go back and revise things and change things, and I'm going to show you all that stuff in a second. So let's go back up to here. Okay. Oh, let's see. So these are these are things that I've discovered and noted over the years. Um, they are things that will dictate if a book will fly to the top of the list or sit in obscurity forever, which totally sucks. You don't want to be in the obscurity pond of nothingness. A good book may never ever be found, which totally sucks. Um, and questionable titles rise to the top like cream. Dude, and nobody wants to eat yucky cream. Makes your stomach sick. Not a happy, not a happy camper there. Anyway, so, and I'm sure we've all seen that happen. And it makes you go, what the heck is going on? Why is this book at the top? And it has nothing to do about the content. It's about the selling elements. It means that that book nailed that book, that that author nailed all of the selling elements. Um, sometimes it's an accident, which is cool. Other times it's done on purpose. And so, yeah, oh, done on purpose. That's that's you're like, no, that can be done on purpose. It's totally done on purpose. You can you can do this part on purpose. It's if you know the rules. And yeah, these are these are cool rules. You're gonna want to know. And it's like this is the meat of the next section. And so get ready to bite into it, dudes. 
or bread. You can say it's bread. Bread's good. Um, let's see. So you want to nail these because this will make or break a book. First, you need a book. If you wrote a good book that appeals to some group, um, definitely awesome. Um, do I think a crappy book can have awesome sales? It's a question people ask me. Totally, yes, it can. Do I think a fantastic book can be dwindling in the sea of literature currently published, never to be seen again? Uh, totally, yes, that can happen. Um, and it means that you screwed up the golden trifecta. The golden trifecta is something that I made up um, because it's what I do with my books. So what does this mean to you? Are you ready? That means that you can take the principles I'm about to talk about in the golden trifecta and the stuff that I just talked about before, which was basically presenting why indies have this incredible opportunity. Um, I hope New York pulls ahead, but at this point, guys, you're on the good side of the fence. You have a firm footing in an industry that is exciting and awesome to be in right now. And taking this class is going to put you leaps and bounds ahead of everybody else. Yeah, I said that. That's okay. Um, anyway, I don't talk a whole lot so um, at lectures and stuff. And so getting, <laughs> getting inside my head, I know a lot of people want to. So here you go. This is what you've been waiting for. It's the golden trifecta. And if you've heard me talk about this before, it's been refined. And it, there's a whole lot more depth than this. I gave a tiny, tiny, tiny class about this um, about two years ago where I just kind of glazed over it. And well, it's because I think it's obvious, but nobody else does. So it's one of those things that we just have to go over. And it'll make a difference to you, world of difference. It, it will help and lift your book. And so will it take it up to the number one? Maybe. Will it take it from number one million up to 100,000? Probably. Um, <laughs> and so basically, if you apply these things, you'll be doing better than you're doing now. Is that for certain? Totally. Like, I yes. Definitely. Um, and I want to make it clear that to do for a book to do well, a lot of people in the past have said that you can't predict if a book will do well, and they've made this kind of like magical aura thing going on around it where it's like, ooh, it's just part of publishing magic. Um, guys, that's bullshit. It's not publishing magic. It's method. Um, that's part of the, the, you know, sorcery stuff that New York's been spewing for years. If you do it this way, you'll get this result. Um, it's like a scientific method, if you want to call it that. Um, got it? Not method. Not method. It's not magic. It's method. It's totally method. It's totally method. I started to read my notes and read two lines at once. It's not magic. <laughs> <laughs> okay, ready? Here we go. Golden trifecta. Uh, da, 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 da. I mentioned this before. The golden trifecta, I don't talk about it that much because I use it and I just see it. And you don't really think to comment on things that are, that you take for granted. Like air. Air is just there. To me, the golden trifecta is just there. So I haven't really spoken about it in much depth. After talking to um, my husband about what I should talk about, he said that this alone is the most valuable piece of information you will ever hear from anybody, and definitely out of my repertoire, about, um, about publishing in general um, and selling, especially publishing, dude publishing. Um, and it's already applied, applied to publishing, which is absolutely awesome. So let me tell you a little bit how the air is over here. Dun, 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 dun. Next slide. Check it out. It's a stool. That's right. Okay. <laughs> a book is like a stool. That's right. We're going, we're going in here. Um, you have these three things on the bottom that hold your book up and say whether or not your book will do well. And you have the blurb and the cover and the sample. If you took this with me before, I had something else on that third leg. It was not the sample at the time. It was the title. I have since uh, changed my opinion. I think you can have any title you want as long as it doesn't totally suck, um, and maybe even if it does totally suck. But these three things, if you screw one of them up, it hinders the sale of your book. You can have a ho-hum title, and it won't hinder the sale of your book. So um, I changed the third leg to the sample. 
okay, why is this a three-legged stool instead of like a giraffe or something else? It's because if one of these is lacking um, where it can't hold its weight, your book isn't going to do well. And like, well, what do you mean? Uh, it just falls. It'll fall down the ranking. It'll fall off the charts. No one will see it. No one will ever see your book, which totally sucks because you spend a lot of time on your book and you love your book and you know someone else out there has got to love your book too. So these three things are major, major, majorly important. Um, the blurb, the cover, and the sample. If you learn absolutely nothing today, you're going to want to learn that the blurb, the cover, and the sample are the three things that hold your book up and make it or break it. This is the golden trifecta, okay? You need these three things working in tandem with each other. And when they are all working very powerfully and very well, that is when you see books in the top 100, guaranteed, okay? Um, guaranteed? Yeah, look at the books in the top 100. All three of those components rock. Um, they they do what they are supposed to do. They function how they are supposed to function. And you're like, Holly, I'm sure there are some covers out there that bleh, wait till we get to that point. You're going to see it, okay? You're going to see the air. It's going to be awesome. Um, anyway, so one part sucks, your stool falls over, your book falls into oblivion, nobody sees it. You need all three of them doing well, okay? The first part we're going to talk about is covers. Covers, I very, very, very strongly believe are stop signs. In marketing, um, Stop signs are a way, uh, okay, let me back up. I'm going to say it this way. Stop signs are a way to summarize your book at a glance, okay? So does that make sense? A cover is a summary of your book visually. And so if you look at my little covers up there, um, they let you know certain things about them. Like, not the name, not my name, this is what we want to know, ready? Covers tell people, and this is important, this is key, if you miss this, you missed your cover. They tell people the genre and the tone of the book. They have to do both, okay, um, at a glance. That's important. If you don't get the genre and the tone at a glance, you screwed up the cover. It's not a good cover. You need a different cover. Um, bad covers will tank your sales, and good covers attract the right readers. Um, original ideas for covers, they seem cool at first, but they kind of fail to convey the proper message. They tend to not give the genre or the tone because uh, they're missing the social cues that people have come to learn to expect that this cover means this. Like romance covers, dude, look, two of the three romance covers in, on the top of my uh, title bar there, they're, it's a kissing couple, almost kissing couple, and yeah. And then that last romance cover is New Adult, and it's a guy standing alone where you look like you want to throw your arms around and give him a hug. Um, give him a hug. Hug. Oh, poor Peter. Um, anyway, and so <sighs> covers communicate something. All three of them have some sort of tone, too. Um, all three of them also did <laughs> amazingly well. Um, let's see. So you want to watch, you want to watch your covers. Um, I have made cover mistakes. I have a whole blog post about it, and I have a couple of my major fails in here. Check this out. Before New Adult was actually called New Adult, I was writing it. And so um, it was the transition from YA into romance, and it ended up being New Adult, where you have your late teens, early 20s, people trying to figure out how to live and how to love and how to get on and how to get through life. Um, Ella Steele was my pen name, which I still have on stuff, and no one knows who the hell it is, so don't get me started on pen names, but there you go. Um, and so you have the old cover, and this picture, uh, this book has a theme about painting, and so I had thought originally that it's kind of different, it's kind of sexy, it has paint in it. Um, yeah, and so I thought it worked. And the book didn't sell, and it didn't sell, and it didn't sell. And it sat there for, what, like five months, seven months? Didn't do anything. It was insane. And so I was ready to just totally chuck the series and stop writing romance. And um, then a few months into it, I changed the cover. I went, let's try a more traditional cover and see what happens. And, oh, my God, it started to sell. And, I, you know, the more traditional romance covers, I'm not nuts about them, but they, they serve a purpose. The book cover the old one on the left that has the white background and all the paint and dude there's a crow in it 
and everybody knows crows are only in creepy books, and so that must be a creepy book about a girl murdered with paint. I had people email me and ask me if this was a book about a girl murdered with paint. And I was like, no. <laughs> and so, um, and I showed other authors, and they all thought it was really cool that it'd be a cool romance book cover. But there's nothing on this that indicates it's a romance book cover. Where's the guy? Where's the kissies? Where's the, you know? A lot of people thought this would be a mystery or a thriller, and so it was attracting the wrong people. There was no. There also the tone is it's too bright. Um, you know this the. The one on the right, it lets you know that, that it's a love story. You have a couple there, and it seems like they're a little bit distant, but he likes her, and the picture itself tells a story, okay? So you know that it's a young couple. Um, it's a little bit dark because the image is a little bit dark. There's some tension in the cover. You'd expect some tension to be in the book. Um, yeah, and so you get, get an idea that the genre is romance, younger romance. Um, you know, it's not senior citizens. And... Um, that that's your kind of story. You know it's not sci-fi. The one on the left, you don't know what the hell it is. Um, for all you know, she's a robot. Um, okay. Next cover. Another example of Holly Blunders. Um, Scandalous. Scandalous was, was a fun book. Okay. Um, on the left, old cover. Looks absolutely amazing in print. Looks really cool. A thumbnail, too. Um, what you want to keep in mind when you're making your covers, when you shrink them to 125 pixels on the longest side, can you still sort of see it? Can you still kind of get the idea of what it looks like? If you can't and it just looks like a bunch of blur that you can't really tell, that doesn't work. You need a new thumbnail. You need a new cover. Um, so the bright cover on here, the one on the left, again, girl alone, paint. I like artists. You, you'll see where, yeah, I, I have a type. Anyway, it's hilarious because I didn't know I had a type until I started writing these books. Um, <laughs> so the girl's like painting herself. But I know that because I wrote the book and, yeah, I picked the picture because it matched the painting in the book. And I thought that was kind of cool and I really didn't want to change the cover. And, dude, I dragged my feet on changing this cover for nine months. I'm not kidding. The one that, the new cover on the right, I don't like that cover. And it's not about whether I like the cover or not. It's about whether or not it tells the reader what kind of book this is. The one on the left does not tell the reader anything. It tells them that this girl is uh, sort of painting herself. She might be stabbing herself. You can't really tell. You know, you'd have to zoom in to kind of see it or see a print copy. And, dude, nobody's going to see a print copy. There aren't print copies anywhere except at the library nowadays. And the library, if they have a print copy, they already bought your book. So it doesn't matter what it looks like in print. And, dude, that's that's... That's that's the harsh truth. It's cold, man. But you can be like loving and hugging your print editions, but most people are only ever going to see the digital one. And so it is very, very, very important that your book looks really stellar in digital. And that's coming from somebody who actually sells a decent amount of print, decent being a lot, um, and come from my print books on my own, you know, just doing it through Create Space is um, about six figures over the, no, it's over six figures for the past year. So it's pretty good, right? Um, it's very good. I'm, I'm ecstatic because uh, I never thought I'd sell that many books in my life. So I wanted to tell you this with, with the books. They should give an idea of the genre, the tone, and you should have a clue as to what kind of content's in here. Okay? At a glance. You got it? So at a glance. Bad covers tank your sales. Good covers attract the right readers. All right. Other things to consider is most of the books covered uh, published this year, they're never ever sit on a shelf. I'm getting ahead of myself. Go back. Um, <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, we just talked about that. So, and if the library gets it, they already they already bought it. So. Questions, Holly. Okay, I have a question for you. If a cover is bombing a book, like it's just wrong, where you're like, I did this really unique original cover and it's got crows in it too, and it's about, you know, chipmunks or something, where it's just, wow, wrong cover, um, should I change it? Yes, 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 yes. I waited way too long to change the cover on Scandalous. It was insane. I totally should have changed it sooner. If a bomb, should you change it? Hell yeah, change it now. Um, readers will know that they already bought the book. And so this is something that I hear people go, well, I can't change the cover. What if it confuses people? Um, give your readers a little more credit. And honestly, as long as you don't change the title, change the cover, and upload it again, it won't let them repurchase it. Um, 
the buying platforms will tell them they already have this book. And so they'll be like, oh, it has a cool new cover. I'll update my, my version. So they have the new cover. Um, yeah, having the wrong cover can also create a sleeper. A sleeper is a book that doesn't perform. So we'll go back to that in a minute. Um, I thought I had a slide, but that's okay. Changing the cover did make a huge difference between Scandalous and, don't look at that, <laughs> between Scandalous, the old one and the new one. Um, and I guess I'm going to go into that later, but just in case I don't, I think I'm going to do it. But yeah, Scandalous, after the cover change, um, it hit the New York Times bestseller list. That was my first book to hit the New York Times bestseller list. What is the content about? It is about a minister. Um, that gets reconnected with her first love um, and has a massive amount of debt from seminary. And no, it is not a true story. <laughs> um, parts of it are based on my life, you know, like the seminary and the debt. Um, seminary is expensive, people. Um, anyway, college is expensive. So let's see. Next part, okay, covers one leg of the stool. We're moving on to number next, blurb. Okay, some people are going to hate me for saying this, and I know you saw it flash for the past two times I clicked back and forth. But you need to take a look at your query letter. You're like, well, I hate query letters. Yeah, I know, I feel for you. Dig out your old query letter. Um, and if you didn't write one, you're going to need to figure out how to write one because they really, really help figure out how to sell your book. And you're like, but I don't have to write one. They were going to, you know, if I sell my book, they'll do it for me. And it's like, dude, no, they don't. Do you know how they, where they get that from? They... The, the blurb for your book actually is derived from your query letter. So if you sell your book to New York, they're going to take your query letter to come up with your blurb. You need your query letter. Write one. Um, you got to get the guts of that out. And it's like, okay, what's the guts? Um, it just needs to mimic the query. It doesn't have to be the whole query. Like, dear sir, dear madam. Um, <laughs> and this is important. Are you ready? Don't treat your sales copy, your blurb, as if it were a summary. It is not a summary. Don't summarize it. Summary bad. It's a tease, okay? Um, you want your book to be your summary, your blurb. To be, you want your blurb to be a tease. You want to give just enough information to get them excited to want to look at the, the next part, the sample. And so you're noticing how we use the cover to kind of lure them in, and then we use the blurb to see if they like it and if it's what they're looking for. And then the next part is the sample where you actually, if you get that part, you're like the sales almost closed um, in terms of they're ready to make a purchase or buying decision or whether or not it's worth their time, okay? Um, hook. Make a clear hook and give them a reason to want to read your book, okay? Um, the hook is the thing that makes people stop and look. And you're like, what? Um, a hook on a book. A hook on a book. Because um, a lot of people, I've heard this explained so many different ways, and it really didn't make sense until it was put into the context of what is the most awesome, amazing, face-grabbing thing about your book. Your blurb needs to reach out of the screen and grab the reader's face like it totally does um, and there are some blurbs that do that where you read them and you're like wow that sounds cool and so think of you as a, as a reader looking for a book where you're like I need this specific kind of book I want this thing and you, you can't find it and it's really annoying and then when you come across it you're like oh that sounds good it's what you're looking for that's why it sounds good and so the hook is something that that pulls people in um, Recently, I was doing this with uh, my daughter, Belle Ward. She writes um, teen fiction. It's about Greek mythology. So it's a bunch of kids, current day, are finding out their gods and goddesses um, and how they fit into the world and the battle of the gods. And so <laughs> it's really interesting. There's a lot of characters. There's a lot of information. And one of the things that is really hard for every author, no matter who you are, is coming up with a blurb because you need to pull out a hook. It needs to be something that um, resonates with uh, your intended audience, and it needs to be something that you're just using to pull them in. And so it doesn't have to necessarily be what the book's about. It's a component of the book. So in her case, one of the things about um, uh, the the one that we went over the other day and, and recently published was that it has uh, the 
golden maidens in it, and she turned them into golden robots. And uh, it was part of Greek mythology, but she twisted a little bit. And um, these robots are only in the book for like a little bit of the time, but for people reading that and the attended audience for this book, which she's trying to capture the attention of, um, she already has a, a fairly big female readership. She's trying to get more guys to read uh, and pick up her books. And they're adventure-based adventure books with no romance. They're totally awesome. Guys should be picking them up. And um, anyway, and, you know, guy readers, especially young ones, are harder to get. And so that was a huge reason why we took Golden Chick Robots and made that her hook. Um, the hook for one of my books up there for the arrangement, that's the middle book there, and that series has sold over a million copies, which is like crazy. It's actually, it's, it's sold way over a million copies. The blurb for this one starts with FML. Um, if you're not familiar with that phrase, um, it means fuck my life. Um, if you're under 18, you probably know what it means, so I just said it, so there you go. If you're over 18 and you didn't know, now you know. Anyway, so it starts off with FML. It's not crass. It's just more um, that statement. People use it when they're texting or on Facebook or tweeting or whatever. It, it means you're just like, ah, life sucks. And so, um, but it's like life sucks to the 10th power um, if you wanted to nerd it up. So on the arrangement, that's one hook. And then the other one is one guy one time could change my life. Um, where the girl is considering something that is going to risk her falling off the moral fence, um, if that makes sense. So she's completely desperate, which you can tell from the FML statement, and you have the possibility of her doing something that, that's not good, that most people would consider bad, um, and you want to see what happens. It has the lure of watching a train wreck. The allure of watching a train wreck. Sorry. Um, so. Those two things combined for a romance is really good. And <laughs> it worked out really well. Sometimes I nail it the first time. Sometimes I nail it the tenth time. That's okay. Dude, fix stuff. Don't work. Fix it. Blurbs should be written and tightened and tightened and written, and they're not the kind of thing that usually come out on the first time. Um, the blurb is one of the first things that the reader sees when considering your book, and you know what they're thinking? I'm going to tell you what they're thinking. They're thinking, are you ready? What kind of book is this? That's what they need to know. What kind of book is this? They're looking for that information. And if they can't tell, you're screwed. True story. Totally screwed. <laughs> they need to be able to tell what kind of book it is. So, here you go. You want to use genre-specific terms to clue readers into what type of story they can expect. You are like, what? You want them to have an idea of the story of the tropes involved. And some genres very heavily rely on tropes, while other ones, well, they may shy away from them a little bit. But your reader still wants to know what's in the story. What can they expect? Is this the kind of story they want? Um, you know, and so that goes in your blurb. Tropes are your very best friend. They're not your friend. They're not your friend of me. They're not. They're your very best friend. If you like, leave them out of your description. You're screwing yourself. Okay. They make it easy to identify, and that's the key to having a really good blurb. Um, that's what you want to do. Okay. Um, and this is the other. I, I said this before. If you don't nail it the first time, fix it. Okay. Check it out. I wrote it with an exclamation point because it's important. Fix it. It's an indie park to be able to refine the listings. We can do that. You can do that like five times a day if you want to. I don't recommend doing it five times a day just because odds are they're going to be exactly the same. It's, write something, put it down, fix it. When you put it up, if you think you had it totally perfect and it turns out you find out later you didn't because people are emailing you and asking you if the crow on the cover means the girl was killed by paint, dude, fix the freaking thing. You don't need to wait five months to fix it. I really shouldn't have. That was dumb. So I'm telling you, you learn from my mistakes, people. Fix it. Don't wait. Oh, here we have the part about sleepers. Um, a sleeper is a book that comes to life late. 
So like it kind of comes out is very lackluster, doesn't really perform, doesn't do anything, gets good reviews, and you're like, what the heck? And so people like the content, but nobody feels compelled to pick it up. That means one of the legs of your stool is broken, or all three of them are. Um, nine months after the publication of this title, it hit the New York Times bestseller list. Bink, it's that one. I showed you before the covers. Um, the blurb, the blurb was also pretty spectacular. You want to see the blurb? I'm going to show you. Check that out. This is the current blurb. This is the past blurb. I'm going to read it to you so that you can actually, you'll hear it. You're going to hear the problem while I'm reading it to you. And you can go, yes, this is this was a contemporary romance book, so you know what genre we're in. Um, I added New York Times and U.S. Today bestseller after it made those lists. So it originally started with, uh, ready? One kiss could have changed Abby's life, but when it didn't happen, she ran. Jack was everything to her, and when he didn't respond, Abby couldn't bear it. Everything about that night, leaning in close to his face, feeling the night breeze teasing her hair, the way his scent filled her head, <laughs> it was burned vividly into her mind, man, including the moment when Jack pulled away. There was no kiss. Abby was wrong. She was wrong about him, wrong about them. Maybe she didn't have to go to college 2,000 miles away, but she did. She had to forget about him. Abby threw herself off the grid, disappearing completely from the life she knew. After completing her undergraduate degree, have you fallen asleep yet? She enrolled in seminary. All contact with her old life has uh, was severed. She never looked back until she was forced to. When Abby puts idealism into practice, her congregation throws her out. Fun times. If she can survive a year on her own, they'll take her back and continue to pay off her student loans. But if she fails, Abby's got enough debt to uh, run a small town. Seminary wasn't cheap. Remember I said that? Because that's true. Um, with no place left to go, Abby returns to New York and her best friend takes her in. Desperate to make her on her own and prove she was right, Abby follows a job lead to a studio on Long Island. It isn't until she hears Jack vo Jack's voice that she freezes. The hairs on her back of her neck prickle as she turns to see Jack ten years later, looking even more tempting than before. Fate is cruel. Abby is left behind, but she's thrown back into it head first. Um... It's like someone hit rewind on her life, and it's 10 years earlier. She's the cotton mouth girl that she'd always been around Jack, and now her future relies on the one man who rejected her. Okay, dude, that is long. One thing, um, one thing, there's lots of things to know about blurbs, but um, if you learn anything else about blurbs, too, is people don't read them. This is too long. Um, most people will scan the beginning, the opening paragraph, and the ending paragraph. So what I've done is check it out. Now it's two paragraphs because nobody reads the whole freaking blurb. And they're looking for indications. They're looking for tropes. There weren't very many in that last one. Check out this one. I never thought I'd see Jack Gray again. So when I hear his voice behind me during a job interview, I nearly fall out of my seat. So you can tell she's looking for a job and he's going to be her boss. There you go, boss trope. It's been years since I've seen him and heard that voice. Since then, Jack's become an artist for the wealthy and I've become dirt poor. Another trope, rich poor. Um, another trope, second chances, because she already knows him. If I don't get this job, I'm screwed. But then I'll have to work near Jack. I'll lose my mind because he's the one who got away. Hello, one who got away, trope. And there's no second chances. Dude, I wrote the trope in the freaking thing. Okay, <laughs> like when it comes to love. So... Do you see trope, 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 trope? There's tropes all over the place. Then I also added um, the genre is new adult romance, the type of book it is because people are, don't know how to read listings to figure out what kind of book it is, and that it has another volume available because this book actually ends at a wedding and it's bizarre to have a second book when they're happily ever after in the first book. And that was like scandalous too. It's the hardest book I've ever written because it's really hard to write a romance book after they're married. I did it. Never doing it again. Uh, <laughs> anyway. So, what do we think about blurbs? They're important. Um, they should be very tight. If you notice, these two things have very similar components, but one is written like a book. The other one is written like a blurb. The second one is very scannable. You can scan it. It's, it's still telling the story, um, but it's bits and pieces of the story. It's made to entice the reader to check out the, the sample. Okay, and so once they read that, they can get an idea of what's going on in there, what aspects they're already familiar with, and if it's the kind of book they're looking for, then they check out the sample. If they like the sample, they buy the book. Okay, and that's where you are. If you have two good legs, you're ready to close the sale, and it all comes down to the sample. The sample can make or break your book. Um, 
and this is the third leg of the stool. So sample, sample, sample. Um, everything you've been doing up till now has been getting the reader to look at that sample. Okay? And so if your sample sucks, you just, you lost your reader. They're not going to look at your book. Um, and I keep saying sale, but it means they're not going to read your book. That's the bottom line. It's not money. They're not going to read your book. <laughs> and we want them to read your book. And so, and I want them to read my book. And so I guess I think about the sample while I'm writing, and you should too. Okay? Um, the sample is about 10% of the book. The sample has to be engaging. It's not optional. It must be engaging. Um, why? Because readers, they don't give a book 100 pages anymore. Um, they're, not, they're not doing that. The teachers who taught us that, you know, like a decade ago or two decades ago, the books that they're buying now and deciding what they're buying, they're doing that based on what they read in the sample. They gave it 10%. The days of 100 pages to get into a story are gone. Um, the world's changed, guys. Okay? And so this is one of the big, huge things that if you realize this while you're writing, um, if, you, if you do this, it'll make a huge difference. And does this mean rewriting your book? It may mean, it may mean refining the beginning of your book. Yeah, it may. Um, if you do this before you even start, I guarantee your book will be so much better because it'll grab people's attention. You want the sample to be a face grabber like that blurb, but it needs to hold them so that they need to read the rest to see what's going on. And it's like, oh, that's really hard. How do I do that? I'm going to tell you how. This is a good way to start a book. Um, and these are things that I use myself, and so I'm telling you about them. So that way you know. And there, are, you'll see these components in other books too. These are the three main things. You can start with conflict, action, or empathy, all three, two, any combination of them. The thing is, conflict, uh, people want to see conflict resolved. And so when you have something start with conflict, and they feel some empathy for one of the characters, bing, you're good. The little boy that lived under the stairs, oh, that's so sad. And so, and his, oh, his horrible, horrible, mean, nasty, you know, uh, uncle and aunt were just horrible people. Yeah, okay. Um, another book, Conflict, Action, and Empathy, or some empathy for some people. <laughs> um, you have this um, very sexy, glittery guy who's, you know, maybe around 20 years old, and this chick uh, that could be any normal girl fighting for her life in a ballet studio where she grew up and she's about to die and we don't know how she got there or anything but they're in the middle of this action-packed scenes fighting for their life and she just never thought she'd die this way at such a young age and oh my god and even if you hate that book you got to look at it and go there are components of that book that are good and you're like what the hell are you talking about I'm talking about Twilight in case you didn't know that and so um Anyway, any book that spikes and gets to the top of the list and stays there, I want to know why. And this is part of the reason why I have an indie brain. It's not just like where I can go, oh, this is crap, or this is good, or this is, that's, it's not about that. It's not about whether the book is good or bad. It's what part of this book is talking to people, is relating to people on such a, a level that it's holding at the top of the list for God knows how long. You know, Twilight, The Hunger Games, um, Harry Potter, um, and dude, everything created equal. They're not equal. Like, they're totally different. <laughs> and But they, they all had that in common. So what is it about these books that is drawing people to them where it, it just it's gone on for years? Those things were considered a phenomenon. Um, and so I want to know why. And as an indie, you should want to know why too. All those books have these same things going on in the beginning, the conflict, the action, and the empathy. Um, for my books, the ones at the top of the screen there, I'll tell you the beginning of Damage, you have conflict, action, and empathy. They're developed from the get-go. They're in the sample. Um, and by the time you're at the end of the sample, you're wondering what she's going to do next. The main character, Sydney, is, has a conflict. It's an internal conflict. You have internal and external conflict. You want to use both of them. Um, she has an internal conflict that she's trying to overcome something from her past. The girl doesn't want to date, and, you know, you're kind of wondering why. Um, the, the action part is a little more low-key, but she's basically going into a restaurant and doing something that most people would think is horribly embarrassing, and it's something that girls can relate to, and so it spikes empathy within them. Um, there's like certain things that every woman in everywhere thinks about that's just absolutely horrifying, like having your skirt tucked into your panties when you come out of the ladies' room on a date where you're with this totally hot guy. Um, 
in this book, in which case the girl's set up on a blind date, doesn't want to be there, and then is relieved to see that her date is actually nice looking and she's getting along with him. And so as soon as she starts to settle down a little bit and orders her food, she finds out she's at the wrong table. And so um, the reader can... It's empathy. It's not sympathy. It's way past that. Where they're like, oh, my God, I feel so bad for her. And so, um, you know, and then you have other stuff going on, and the arrangement starts with action. The girl gets carjacked, and the conflict is there where she's it's internal and external because she has to deal with a carjacker, and her car is not worth anything, and the books in her car are worth more than her freaking car, but she needs them, and she has no more money. She has to go get them. Anybody that's ever been poor or struggled with anything automatically relates to her, and then she does the opposite of what me or anybody I know would have done, and she chases her freaking car. Like, I would have walked over to the side of the road and just started crying. Um, no, she doesn't. She chases her car. And so people are rooting for her because she's an underdog. Um, we we want to be that person. We want to we want to persevere. And it's more than that. We want to kick ass. We want to be ninjas. And so um, you're like, I thought you wrote romance books. This is this is a huge part of what my books are about. They're about life. And so um, and no matter what you're writing, those things, conflict, inner and outer, action, empathy, those are all things that are evocative that if you can relate to the reader on that level, that's totally amazing. You should totally do it. Um, let's see. These are bad ways to begin a book, okay? Um, <laughs> and some people are going to be like, there's no bad way to begin a book. I, I totally I disagree with you, man. There are, there are bad ways to begin a book. If you start a book with an info dump, um, you know, that uh, this character has long, black, flowing hair, and she's standing in front of the mirror, and she's combing it and combing it. You know, unless rats start falling out of her hair or something you wouldn't expect. It's so boring. And that'd be action, so that doesn't count. Um, and then backstory. Backstory very rarely works, in my opinion, because it's an info dump. Um, that's where you take a bunch of information about the character and the story, and it's information that the reader needs to know to have a good understanding of the characters in the world and everything. And if you're writing um, fiction that has a world, this is hard. But you can't do that. You can't just dump a bunch of crap on people at the beginning because they don't care. They need to be emotionally invested in the story before you do that. And so a good story has the information and the backstory and the world spread throughout the book. It should not be in the beginning. Okay? Um, does that mean it's not in the beginning at all? No. It means that um, you have enough in the beginning to give a sense of where they are and that um, you spread your info through the book. Like, think about like sprinkles on a cupcake. You don't want to dump them all on the left side. That looks dumb and it doesn't taste as good. You want to sprinkle them all over the top of it, over the whole thing. Nice and even. Um, it's important, definitely. No info dumps. Um, and for people building a world, so if you're doing a sci-fi, fantasy, anything like that, um, Demon Kissed has, that was my debut novel. Um, it's, it's written like a debut novel, and anybody that's written for a while knows what that means. Um, it's a little too wordy, a little too poetic, but that's okay. Um, as you go on, it, it, it it thins out a little bit and it moves really fast too, even even written the way that it is now. Um, I'm like smiling like a dork. It's like, oh, Damon Kiss, that's so nostalgic. My point is that this, I loved creating the world. It has this huge world um, where the current world we live in, so, you know, Earth, is, um, it also has, um, it has the underworld and it's this whole underworld that it isn't anybody else's, it's mine, um, where you have all these different facets, all these different characters, um, and it's not characters, it's beings, um, and they have their own battles and their own fights, and you have to get all this information across to the reader for the main character's struggle to make any sense. And so the way that I had started it, it was with... Um, an action scene at the beginning where the girl is uh, fighting for her life and she doesn't really know what's going on. And then as you go through the story, you slowly find out what she's changing into and what's happening and how the world around her, she's suddenly noticing all this other stuff that she didn't notice was there before. So the reader actually discovers the world at the same time as the heroine in that story. And um, that, that story really has a really huge world. So over the course of five books, everything from Earth now to apocalyptic Earth after 
um, including uh, the underworld and worlds within the underworld. I mean, like, dude, it's it's a it's a big concept. And so that when people are writing fantasy or science fiction, that's one of the huge problems that they have is where do I start? And you want to start as late in the story as you can, and you do not want to do an info dump, and um, you got to figure out how to spread it out through your story. If you want some samples of that, you can totally look at that. They're, you know, Demon Kissed for, for an idea. That's young adult. Um, Bane is another book that I've written. Um, that's young adult. Um, the world in that one is a little less complex. Demon Kissed is extremely complex in terms of uh, what kind of world it is and how much explaining you have to do, um, which is why I mentioned it. And it's also sold a ridiculous number of books. At some point, I stopped counting, and so that one hasn't been tallied in a while. Um, okay, ready? Next slide. I want to make this totally clear that good writing and awesome art, okay? I do think writing is art. Um, I, I'm not into mass-produced crap. Um, and even though I write fast, my heart's in every book that I write. And I went over that already, so I hope you, you're well aware of that. But that said, a good artist and a good writer is going to consider the commercial elements during the crafting period. That's really important because these things, like when you're writing the sample, you should think about the reader because that's the person you're writing it for. I mean, think about how you would talk to a four-year-old compared to how you would talk to a 40-year-old. You're telling them the story of the three little pigs. Um, most of us would change the way we're speaking when we're talking to a four-year-old compared to how we're talking to a 40-year-old. Our word choices change. Where we decide to start changes. What information we decide to give changes. Um, and so you're like, you're talking about genre. Well, kind of, but it's like going, who is this written for? Think about this person as you're writing it. Um, for me, books, they're, they're, they're a bearing of the soul, but they're confessions of whoever is reading them. And so uh, even when you're writing, if you go, I'm writing for me, yes, that's true, but you're writing for you with the intent of someone seeing this at some point. And so maybe you don't want them to see it tomorrow, but at some point someone is going to see it because that's why we wrote it. Um, that's why we're writers. That's why we're artists. We take life and figure out how to transform it into words, into to emotions and um, visions that connect with people on a very basic level that give hope and dreams and aspirations and make life worth living. I mean, like, that's just an amazing thing. And saying that you don't consider that during the crafting period is ludicrous. And so while I may be calling it commercial elements, it just means you're thinking of your reader. And so, okay, the reader now is faced with dealing with 10%. The way that they find stuff, they have this listing. It's getting really freaking hard to find stuff. There's so much stuff popping up every day. It pops up spikes and goes back down because of ads, because of pricing, because of whatever. And so um, you've got to know this too as a reader. It's, buying a book today is not the same as it was 10 years ago. You could pretty much rely on the also bots, um, which now all my also bots are my own books. And so it doesn't really go outside of my stuff. Um, because I've written so many books, and so, um, which is nice, but at the same time, people that are looking for books like H.M. Ward may not find them, um, or for people looking for books like yours may not find them, and so it's something that you want to consider while you're actually making the book, and I, I do that. That's important. It's important for me, for the readers to be able to find the book, because they're part of the reason why I'm writing it. I'm writing it for me, and I'm writing it for them. Um, I write things so that they can be read, and I think that you guys are too, otherwise you wouldn't be sitting here listening to me. Um, so we need to have, we need to have control over these things, um, and part of it is so that we can change them. Um, I'll go back to that in a minute. And you can change them a week later, a month later, a year later. The market changes. You can update stuff. You know, if you go the traditional route, you're not going to have those options. Stuff doesn't change. It just kind of gets stuck into the into the way things are. You know, and and that's okay. That may work for some people. But if you're in this in this webinar, that's there's you're not happy with that. That's why you want to have control over these things. We want to maximize the reach of the book, um, and we'll, we want to expand beyond what the traditional 
publicly published book world offers us, which is awesome. That means you want to be ahead of the curve. Um, and taking this class definitely is a huge way to get ahead of it. Um, so I've talked about a bunch of stuff and how I do it. These are all the things that I do. Um, and I, I basically do them in order. I write the book first and I think about the sample while I'm writing it. Um, and when I go back and read it, because you have to take into the sample length, this is just the length of the book, it also includes the metadata. And so if you have table contents, the cover, and other, other stuff that's kind of bulking it up, um, you, you want to know where your sample cuts off. It's really important. And so, because you want it to cut off at a spot where people are like, ah, I need more. And so, um, and if you look at what my readers say, they always say that they want more. That's a good thing. Um, having people want more. And so in the blurb, I'll write down what I think initially it should be and try to make it as tight as possible. And sometimes I just miss the mark. And, uh, you know, I write it down anyway. And blurbs are hard for me. I'd rather have my teeth pulled out of my head with a spoon. Like, I just, blah, God, I hate them. And um, <laughs> anyway, it's just, it's a necessary evil. And if you think of it, pragmatically like that, that this needs to convey to the reader what kind of book this is and what's going on, and it's like, oh God, that sounds awful. You you should close your eyes, think about your book, think about your characters, think about the traits and things going on that you like most. There are usually a couple scenes, a couple characters, a couple instances that jump out at you, you know, in any given book, any given story. If you don't know what they are for yours because you're too... Uh, deep in your book, too invested in your book, ask somebody that will actually tell you. You know, like the Golden Girls for Bell's book. The Golden Girls. <laughs> the um, the Golden Robots. They're made out of gold, man. They're shiny. Shiny, beautiful chick bots. Um, <laughs> teenage boy bug, right? Um, <laughs> anyway, and so she's like, why are we using that? And then she saw the description and she was like, oh, okay. And so, um, yeah, and basically it, it's just you're using the imagery to help people to capture the right audience because, you know, you don't want people that are like, oh, this is silly. They would never read something like that. And you want the people that are like, cool, go the robots. And so, or, or you know, people that with like um, damaged or the arrangement, you, your, your blurb is attracting them. It's like bait or nectar or whatever you want to say. And whatever kind of bait you put out is going to attract the right kind of person that you want to read it. And if there's a lot of intentionality put into these things, you will connect with the right kind of reader. Um, and so that's, that's the main thing that I wanted you to get out of that. The cover, the blurb, and the sample are the three main things that will make or break your book. Having flexibility to go back and change things is a huge deal, is, is the key to success in this case. And it's one of the best things about being an indie. You know, we get multiple chances at convincing the reader that our book is worth picking up. And, you know, it's just, it's really cool. And honestly, I, I told you this in the beginning, I would have given anything to get this information early on. Um, I, I figured it out by trial and error. Um, not only is information highly practical, but it's something that you can master. Once you see it, you see it. And it becomes like air, and you just figure it out, and you do it, and you move through it, and it's there. And even if you screw it up and you try something different, uh, it's not fatal. You can go back and change it. Being an indie author is amazing. If someone said that I'd earn seven figures a year, a year, when I started, I would have laughed in their face. That's insane. Who the hell earned seven figures from being an indie writer? I do. Like, <laughs> and part of it is because I ask why. I want to know why with everything. Why is this at the top of the list? Why is this book selling? Why is this one not selling? Why is this book doing that? Why is that one not? And so asking why is a huge reason. And so I just never would have thought that that would be possible. But with the market the way it is and the direct access to readers, dude, it is possible. And you know what? Not everybody's going to hit that amount. But everybody has a shot at it, which is part of the attraction. And even before I was doing that, I was definitely making more money than I ever could have without it. Um, that That's amazing. And it, yeah, I've just heard so many stories over the years about indie writers that have done this, that have been able to leave their day jobs and they just keep going. And it's, it's an amazing time to be a writer. Um, I have to say that too, that I, I like what I write and I write about what calls to me. And it's just, it's a lot of fun. 
And when I saw when I saw this the the golden trifecta idea, it really cemented things. Every book that I've released in the past um, eighteen months has hit the top hundred on Amazon. Every single one. That's crazy. This plan, <laughs> this plan is my golden goose, and I'm sharing it with you. So get your uh, get your golden goose notes all ready there, and <laughs> you're gonna go apply them and be rock stars. I wanted to tell you that I'm gonna have resources on my blog. Um, that's my blog information. Um, by going to, I mean, it, it should be there already. Um, there'll be more information on sales with uh, links to previous posts about sales, covers, and market changes. Um, and like I told you before, I really don't pull punches on what I'm talking about. The market's changing, things are different, and it's more challenging, and it's more fun. Um, and so all those things put together, this is a fly by your seat of your pants and um, kind of industry. And, and I like that. I like the challenge of it. And I'm so glad that I got to share this information with you guys today. Um, if you want to catch up with me on Twitter and you want to see watch out for some more workshops, um, I do some of them, <laughs> like one or two a year. I'm going to have some more tips on my YouTube page. I'm currently working on that for writers. Um, so you can follow me at Twitter at hmward.com or on Facebook at author hmward. And um, if you have questions about today's workshop, feel free to contact me through either platform. I am happy to answer your questions. And so I am so glad that you guys came today and that you came to listen to this. And I hope you go out and use this information and that it, it changes lives and puts people up to the next level because um, whatever's coming next is what's coming next and you guys are going to be rock stars. Thank you so much for, for coming and listening and I wish you the best. Thanks so much. Bye.